asking around for Channel 12 News first at 5 and tonight at 6. And, of course, we're probably going to be something about the Masters. Hello, Dave. Hi, Peggy. You know, most of the golfers out here looking for the green jacket this week. Well, I'm wearing the green shirt, so I got the next best thing. Beautiful day again today. And, of course, the big news of the day, the Par 3 contest. Lachlan McLean, Paul Davis will have full coverage. We have two crews on the course right now gearing up. Uh, which will it'll start about two o'clock. We'll have all the highlights for you later on. Also today we'll talk about security. We'll show you what folks are doing to keep you safe inside and outside of the gates of the national. And also we showed you some of the hot items outside of the gates as far as souvenirs were on Washington Road. Well today we'll take you inside and show you what the hot hot items are here at the national. Now. Folks may be complaining about the lines at the souvenir shop, but nobody complaining about the weather. Bob You're Smith. right, especially myself. Uh, you know, we thought it would be much cloudier today, or at least the bulk of the day. And look at it, not a cloud in the sky. It's just a beautiful day. And that uh, just goes to show you, uh, I think the green jackets over there in the main office there have a direct line upstairs. It never <laughs> rains on the golf course, Bob. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, this weekend may, uh, may change all of that. Let's take a look at the five-day forecast now. We'll be able to see that uh, increasing clouds are on tap for Friday but tomorrow's a nice day. A little bit on the chilly side, 68 for a high, 70 on Friday, slight chance of a shower late in the day, then Saturday and Sunday, computer models are showing a chance of showers or thunderstorms each day. Now the timing of these, whether they're going to come in the evening, the morning, the afternoon, or maybe overnight, is yet to be seen, but uh, be on the lookout, be prepared for showers and thunderstorms Saturday and Sunday with highs 72 to 74, and as everybody heads back home, partly sunny on Monday, 68 degrees. That's it from here, Peggy. We'll wrap it up We'll send it back to you. All right, thanks, you guys. And thank you. Producer Dave Grandinsky is where all the action is. A beautiful day to be at the Masters, Dave. That is correct, Peggy. And I can tell you what, it looks beautiful, but it is very windy on the course. And I can tell you that the scores are high. Just talked with some folks who are inside the press room. I got an update on the leaderboard, and the scores are up there, and the wind is to blame. Of course, tonight, we'll have all the highlights from it for the, from the first round for you later on. Paul and Lachlan are uh, going to have that for you. Lachlan McLean is heading out right now. Some of the golfers are coming off the course as I speak. We'll talk to some of them, find out about those windy conditions. Also today, about 145. The uh, pairing that everyone is waiting for, Nick Faldo and Tiger Woods, they will tee off at that time. And also, Laureate will be following them. She's going to follow the gallery and uh, give us a glimpse of Tiger Mania. And also today, if you're getting a little golfed out, it is the Thursday of Masters Week. We uh, continue our travel guide to the area. Head out to Aiken and do some things. We'll show you some things to do out there. And uh, basically, the weather, Bob Smith, uh, Pretty much you can do anything you want, no matter where. You know, Augusta, Aiken, hey. Swainsboro, you name it. Dave, it's a beautiful day, but you, you can see the wind kicks up now and then. And, of course, with the wind coming and going, that makes it even more difficult. And, of course, the dry weather has caused the greens to be very, very fast. And so we have some high scores. And it looks like the dry weather will continue through tomorrow and the breezy conditions also through tomorrow. Looking for a high about 65, 68 today. It's about 58 out here right now. I want a quick... Uh peak at the weekend. Okay, weekend looks like Saturday, showers and thunderstorm, be six degrees, so Saturday's the day we're focusing in on for the really heavy thunderstorms that could bring some really heavy rains. Okay, thanks Bob, that is it from the National for now, we'll be back at five o'clock with all of your first round action. Peggy, back to you. You guys make sure you keep that sunscreen on because even though it's a little bit windy and maybe a little bit cooler, you might get burned and then it'll be unhappy for the weekend. Exactly. Thanks guys. Well, that's going to do it for tonight at 6 o'clock. Producer Dave Gunjinski is out there having all the fun. Dave, what are we looking forward to later today? Well, of course, Peggy, round two of the 1997 Masters underway. Some big names have already teed off, including Nicholas and Norman. Big names yet to come, including Sankowski and Azinger, of course, Tiger Woods, and our leader, John Houston. We'll, we have two crews on the course right now. We'll have all the highlights for you. Paul and Locke will be here at 5 and 6 with not only the highlights, but the latest leaderboards. Now... Folks get out here early. When they know the big names are going off late, they get to these holes early. The 15, 16, 17, 18 holes, you won't believe how early they get there. Donnie Porter will show you that later on today. And also tonight, end of the week, maybe looking for a new place to eat. We have some places you may not have known about in Augusta that you can take in a, a dinner tonight. Now, Bob, tonight might be the, the night to eat dinner out on the patio. Uh, that's right. It'll be a nice mild night. Uh, I think the rain will not come in until after midnight. By the way, I've been paring every hole every day this week. <laughs> but tomorrow, I think, I think I'm going to uh, pull some bogeys tomorrow. But it uh, looks like we'll get the rain tomorrow. There's a really good bet, about a 70% chance of rain tomorrow. Maybe some steady rain in the morning, then maybe clearing out a little bit.
little bit, and then in the afternoon, of course, the threat of a thunderstorm, and that's what we're really concerned about uh, is the thunderstorm. It's been a beautiful week all week. Tomorrow, a little rain, but that's no that's problem. That's right. Sunday looks pretty good, though, 72 degrees with plenty of sunshine. It's going to be windy, though. Okay. So that will be challenging for the golfers. Okay. Peggy, that's it from the National. We'll see you at 5 and 6 o'clock with the latest and the leaderboards. All right. Thanks, you guys. David Justice and Marquise Grissom are now Cleveland Indians. Dave Grindinski joins us live in the newsroom with more on the trade. Well, Peggy, you know, it's a trade that if you're a Braves fan and you've been following the Braves, it really shouldn't come as a surprise to you at all. It's really a move that's being done out of financial reasons more than anything else. In return for Grissom and Justice, the Braves will get all-star outfielder Kenny Lofton and left-handed pitcher Alan Embry. The Braves are trying to free up some money so they can sign some of their own free agents next year, namely Tom Glavin and Greg Maddox. Justice, as you can remember, missed uh, nearly all of last year with a, a shoulder injury. He hit the game-winning home run, though, against the Indians two years ago and is considered too risky and too high-priced. Grissom, of course, has been the Braves' leadoff hitter and center fielder for the past two years. He will be expected to do the same in Cleveland. Uh, he's been the Braves' center fielder since he came over here from Montreal. David Justice scheduled to make about $12 million over the next two years. And, of course, that's a little too much money for the Braves to handle. The good news, though, about Lofton is he is considered one of the game's best center fielders. The bad news, though, his contract is also up at the end of the year, and the Braves will have to come up with some money to pay him if they want to keep him. We'll have more on this story for you later tonight on Channel 12 News at 5 and also at 6 o'clock. Peggy, back to you. Thanks, Dave, for that live update. From birth to first and only their second year, Channel 12's Dave Grinzinski has a closer look at how the West was won. There's no secret as to how the Panthers won their first NFC West division title. All boil down to the defense to win the division. And, and everybody on that defense wouldn't have won it any other way. We were happy where we were, the situation we were in. I personally got that holding penalty and was like first down to what, two, three yard line. And then we were able to sack whatever and just, just come after them. And then the big turnovers. The Panthers hounded Steelers quarterbacks Mike Tomczak and Cordell Stewart all afternoon, holding them to just 102 yards passing for the game. I thought we were I thought we were playing well. I mean, we dropped one in a long scramble on Cordell Stewart. And he's just that type of athlete that can just, just make things happen. I mean, that's just Cordell. And um, so it's a matter of just keeping him in the pocket and containing him the second half. The additions of Pro Bowlers Lamar Lathan and Kevin Green gives this team better leadership never seen before by an expansion team. Well, I'll tell you what, the two times that I've had in this team, hey, we're on the right track, we have a lot of positive players, hey, we got to the top. The combination of four Pro Bowl starters and a defensive-minded head coach in Dom Capers, and the equation becomes simple, defense wins championships. Mission accomplished, baby. It's just a start. Now we're going to the postseason. I so love everyone that the Panthers for real. Get back to the Kennedy and Harry Cool. This is all about defense wins championship. This is what it's all about, baby. Great feeling. Number one right now winning the NFC West. Champs. So the Panthers will take this NFC West championship as an early Christmas present. Well, they know the fruits of their labors could come at the end of January in New Orleans. In Charlotte, Dave Grinjinski, Channel 12 Sports. The Panthers won the most important battle of all. On a team carried by its defense all season long, Carolina knew to beat the Dallas Cowboys and needed to control the line of scrimmage. I can't say enough about those guys. They played as well as any offensive line has played in probably the last half of the season. So we haven't been getting credit for anything all year, and, and I don't think we ever will. But uh, we're just going to come out and we're going to you know, take care of our business. All game long, the Panthers pounded the Cowboy front line, gaining nearly 130 yards on the ground against a defense that only gives up just over 90 yards a game. Did you guys feel like coming in and could run the ball that well? I, I think each of us did, yeah. We felt like we had to, and uh, it certainly played a big part in the game. I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm surprised we ran the ball as well as we did. Uh, that just goes to show you what kind of what kind of offensive line they are. They came out and they decided they were going to win. They were going to win the line of scrimmage and, and battle their asses off, and that's what they did. And when Carolina needed the throw, Collins had the time to put it up. Just like an offensive lineman, you guys won this game. Well, I don't know. I think it's, I'm going to credit everybody else. Uh, you know, we, we had a partner in, uh, 
you know, kick it, like I said, it's, it's a team it's a team sport, and that's why, you know, we stick together and, uh, and the team won this, the game today. So the Carolina Panther offensive line withstood the test of the NFL's number three defense, but now they'll face a defense featuring Reggie White and a Green Bay Packer team that has won 17 straight at Lambeau Field. In Charlotte, Dave Grinjinski, Channel 12 Sports. Our Dave Grinjinski was there. And Deion Sanders didn't disappoint some of his biggest fans. Neither did Michael Irvin, Sterling Sharp, or Rodney Hampton. They were all in Augusta playing in the Quest Foundation's charity basketball game to raise funds for underprivileged children. This is a great occasion to be able to get to know us, and it's a great occasion for us to get to know them. The great thing about the NFL, we all come together for a good cause. One of the guys call, and everybody rushes. Not just anybody, I mean, you got the Deion Sanders, and me, and myself, you know, you got the Rodney Hampton, the Sterling Sharp, we are big names. Big names they are, and play big they did, and nobody can home without a smile. Well, anytime it's something for the kids, you know, uh, I'm willing to do it. So, uh, like I said, it's a great cause, and I'm glad everybody came out to support Arthur this weekend. I'm really happy with the guys that came out. Uh, all of them won now, and uh, we're just planning on having a great evening. So for one day, the NFL's elite gave up open field tackles for wide open jump shots, but it didn't matter because it was all for the kids. In Augusta, Dave Grinjinski, Channel 12 Sports. All right, thank you, Dave. To the news that the NCAA would not impose additional penalties on the Georgia football program had Georgia's top dogs breathing a sigh of relief. Realistically, I don't know how they could have, uh, uh, what would have been better or, or worse, but I know that, uh, you know, I'm pleased that we have this behind us. We are aware that it's rare for the committee to accept an institution's investigation and self-imposed sanctions without additional penalties, and for that we are grateful. Not only can players and coaches get their minds back on football, the staff can now look to build again towards the future. The number one concern of all the kids that we recruited was, was, uh, were those two factors, uh, bowl and TV implications. And we kept telling them it wasn't going to happen, but they, you know, everybody else was saying that we were going to get the death penalty. I regret that uh, Coach Donovan has to inherit this situation since it would be a handicap, but I have complete confidence that he will work through the problem and eventually give us the type of program that we all want at Georgia. And Coach Donnan agrees. I do, don't feel like this is going to be uh, a handicap that will uh, keep us from uh, reaching our goals. Sanford Stadium is quiet today, but that doesn't mean the Bulldog faithful isn't cheering because school officials know the program crossed the goal line for the first time this year. In Athens, Dave Grinjinski, Channel 12 News.